So last week we concluded that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact a real historical person. But now how do we get from real historical figure to Jesus, God in the flesh? Hey guys, Jeff here from That Bold Life, your weekly encouragement to help you live a bold life for Jesus. So the question is, we know now that Jesus is a real historical figure, and if you haven't watched that video, you can do so. It'll be linked right here. You can watch the video on how we know that Jesus was real in history uh, without using the Bible. So we know that Jesus was real. He was a real historical person. He was a real historical figure and teacher and rabbi. But how do we know that Jesus Christ, the one that we base our faith on, is actually God. Where do we get that information? And for me personally, this was a hurdle that I climbed when I came to Christianity at the age of 21, uh, which if you're not familiar with my testimony, it'll also be linked here and you can check that out. But whenever I came to faith, I had a personal experience, but then I had to climb all of these hurdles to figure out, okay, was Jesus actually God or was he just a great teacher and he amassed a huge following? We see that with preachers today, that they are great teachers and they have huge followings. Was that who Jesus was or was Jesus actually God? And this is, I think, a hurdle we've all got to climb through. And to start off, I want to read a pretty famous quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says it like this, Jesus, in reference to him being God or a great teacher, he would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice, either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. And he goes on to say, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, and you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And I have to agree with Mr. C.S. Lewis on this one, that when we read the Gospels, when we read the accounts of Jesus and the words he spoke, the miracles he performed, he never left open the option that he was just a great human teacher. From the very beginning, he was claiming and proclaiming that he is indeed God. He is indeed the Messiah, the one who came. And we can see this all throughout scripture. Within the Gospels, we see in Matthew 16, Jesus comes to the disciples and he says, who do you say I am? And they say, well, some say that, you know, you're John the Baptist, some say that you're Elijah. And Peter looks at him and Peter says this, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, a, a good Jewish boy at this point, a good Jewish rabbi would have just looked at Peter and said, you are the devil, leave from my presence which we know Jesus is capable of saying that. He says it to Peter at a later time. But a, a good Jewish man would have said, that is blasphemy, leave from my presence now. Right? But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says this, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Right here, a good Jewish rabbi, if Jesus were a good Jewish teacher, he would have just accused Peter of blasphemy. Peter probably would have been crucified for that statement, unless that statement was true. And Jesus confirms that it was true, and it was not revealed to Peter by flesh and bone, but it was revealed to Peter by Jesus' Father in heaven, God Yahweh. We see again in John 5.18, where it says, For this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. It's saying here that the Jews wanted to kill him. In fact, they did kill him for claiming to be the son of God and making himself equal with God, something that a good Jewish teacher would never do. Again, that would be blasphemy if it were not true. Again, we read in John 8:58. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. Which is a reference, of course, to when God proclaims his name to Abraham in the book of Exodus. He says, I am who I am. And that I am, of course, means Yahweh, the very name of God. And Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus declared that he is God in that moment. 
John 20, 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Again, a good Jewish teacher, if Jesus were only a good Jewish teacher, he would have looked at Thomas, accused him of blasphemy, had him crucified and moved on. Instead, he doesn't, he accepts that phrase. He allows Thomas to call him my Lord and my God. So when we look at the Gospels, when we look at Scripture, we can't possibly say that Jesus was a good Jewish teacher, because if he were just a Jewish teacher, he was a terrible one. He let his disciples work on the Sabbath. He let his disciples call him God, call him Yahweh. He made himself equal with God. He claimed to be the Son of God in public. If he were a good Jewish teacher, well, he would have been a terrible Jewish teacher. I have to agree with C.S. Lewis. He was either liar, lunatic, or the son of God. Now I wanna tell you about why I believe he was the son of God. And I believe that is truly proven with the power of the resurrection. Now I don't have time in this one video to completely unpack everything I believe and all the proofs and undeniable facts there are about the resurrection, but I promise you that video will come at a later time but I wanna tell you about what led me to faith and what led me to believe Jesus was indeed the Son of God, and that was the resurrection. You should know that the entire power of Christianity lies in the resurrection. Paul says it himself in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. The very power of Christianity lies in the resurrection, and there is so much proof, historical fact, historical writings on the resurrection that most scholars cannot deny the very fact that Jesus was killed, put into a tomb, and his body disappeared. Now, there are all kinds of naturalistic reasonings, you know, things that don't exactly add up, and I assure you that video will come hopefully next week, actually. Yeah, let's do that. Stay tuned. Next week, we will have a video on why the resurrection is true. Okay? That video will be right here if you're watching this after the fact. But you should know that the very power of Christianity lies within the resurrection, right? Because if Jesus simply died and rotted in a tomb, he was not God. However, we have historical proofs that his body did not remain in that tomb. We have historical proofs that his body disappeared. And then we have historical proofs that his followers, even though they, they walked away for a few days, which makes sense, of course, with the gospel stories, although Christianity died for a few days, that afterwards it says that Christianity exploded. In extra biblical accounts, written historical accounts outside of the Bible, it says that Christianity exploded in popularity after the death of the one it was about. That's very strange of a world belief, right? It's hard for me to say that Jesus is Christ, Jesus is God, and then Jesus dies, and then I'm like, okay, maybe I was wrong, right? And we see this, we see this in the Gospels, the disciples all kind of go back to their old ways of life, saying, okay, I was wrong, he is not God. But then all of a sudden, Christianity explodes. So how do we know that Jesus actually raised from the dead? And one of my favorite proofs of this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In this, Paul, remember when Paul's writing it, Paul's writing it shortly after the time that Jesus actually resurrected and appeared to 500 people. He says, most of these 500 people are still alive. He says it like it's a challenge. Don't believe me, go and find these people and they will testify that Jesus in fact revealed himself to them after he resurrected from the grave. Paul is saying, don't just believe my words. There are people who have actually seen the resurrected Messiah. Ask them. That's incredibly powerful because if I'm upholding a lie, I'm saying, no, he didn't, no one's seen him. Trust me, just be believe me, it happened, right? But Paul is saying, don't just listen to me, find one of these 500 men who's seen him and ask them and they'll tell you all about it, right? Paul challenges people to go find one of these 500 men. Another proof is actually where the disciples went out preaching the resurrection. 
right? Jesus was crucified and buried in Jerusalem and they go back out into Jerusalem and preach the resurrection. It would have been impossible to prove the resurrection in the city Jesus was crucified and buried in if his body remained in the tomb because everyone could have walked by and be like, nope, those guys are nuts. There's Jesus. He's still in the tomb. Where they put him? The body was gone. The body was no longer in the tomb, which is impossible to happen because they rolled a stone in front of it and had a Roman army standing before the tomb so that the body could not be stolen. It says that. How else was Jesus' body removed? Jesus was clearly dead. The Romans were very good at what they did. They would have been crucified for allowing a living person to come down from the cross. He was obviously dead, obviously put in the tomb, a Roman army put before it. The followers of Jesus did not have the numbers, especially after Jesus died, to go and fight a Roman army to steal the body. How else was that tomb empty, if not by the very power of God resurrecting Jesus from the dead? And all of these things, the empty tomb can be proven outside of the Bible. There are writings, there are debates, there are first, second, third, fourth century writings about how the tomb was empty, that the Jewish authors at that time believed the body was stolen, that they believed that, you know, they snuck in in the middle of the night and took the body. We know that would have been impossible because of the army that was guarding the tomb. But then the third and probably the most powerful thing for me is what the disciples did that after Jesus died and after Jesus resurrected, or maybe he didn't, if you believe he did not resurrect, the disciples then turn around and they go out and proclaim that Jesus Christ had resurrected from the grave. The funny thing about that is, at this time, they were trying to shut down Christianity so anyone who claimed that Jesus was risen would have been killed. Yet, Christianity grew faster than it ever had before. While they were being persecuted, while they were being murdered for saying Jesus is risen, the disciples never shut their mouth. They went out and proclaimed Jesus was the risen God. All of, They proclaimed it to the nations, to the masses, that every single disciple, every single apostle went out and was martyred for the faith. They were killed in their extra biblical accounts testifying to the deaths of several of these apostles that they were killed, they were crucified, they were skinned, that they were boiled in oil. We can actually see this and read it in extra biblical accounts that it really happened and yet Christianity did not die. In fact, it prospered. You see, but the very men who would have made up this lie would have been those 12 men. And I don't know of 12 men that would die to uphold a lie. I think at the very last minute, no dude, actually I was just kidding. You can take me down, we're good. Uh, didn't actually happen, right? But no, they never denied it. At least what we can read in the gospels, what we can read in extra biblical accounts, they never denied the gospel. And the gospel and Christianity continued to grow exponentially after that. That is why I can have faith that Jesus, yes, he existed and he is truly God in the flesh that he came, he lived, and he died for my sins. That is what I believe. And yeah, it takes some faith, but there are some evidences that make Jesus as God the most probable explanation for the resurrection, for the existence, for Christianity in general. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I release content just like this every single week. So go ahead and slap that subscribe button. All right, guys, I hope you leave me a comment down below and let me know how this video spoke to you. Again, a disclaimer, I have no intention of arguing in the comments. So please, if that is your intention, don't even bother. Uh, but slap that dislike button. I'll know you disagree and it's cool. We'll go our separate ways. All right, love you guys. Keep living that bold life.